Welcome, newcomer. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Dr. Guy. I'm the teacher of the class here. And what we're doing is going through the book of First Corinthians right now. So right now we're on chapter four. All right. And uh, it's a very good chapter. It's, it's very much related to the same theme that Paul's been on for a while. And you know, he got this letter from um, the fa a family in Corinth describing how the church that he started was descending into factions. Um, some, peop some of the people were saying, you know, well, we, we like Apollos better than Paul. Apollos is more eloquent. He dresses better. Paul's a foreigner. Apollos is American. And so, consequently, there was the, they, they, they started fighting one another because of these differences. And Paul is like, he spends the first three, the four chapters in First Corinthians, he just can't get over this. What is wrong with you people? This is incredibly immature and incredibly inappropriate. And so he's trying to give them a mature perspective so that they can understand why this devolving into factions is a really, really bad idea. All right, so let's jump right in, shall we? Don't imagine us leaders to be something we aren't. We're servants of Christ, not his masters. We are guides into God's most sublime secrets, not security guards posted to protect them. The requirements for a good guide are reliability and accurate knowledge. It matters very little to me what you think of me, even less where I rank in popular opinion. I don't even rank myself. Comparisons in these matters are pointless. I'm not aware of anything that would disqualify me from being a good guide for you. But that doesn't mean much. The master makes that judgment. So he's coming out, coming out, just hitting with both fists here, saying, look, judging each other, the fact that you're judging me and saying, Paulus is better, I like Apollos better, you know, Paul wears the same coat every day, you know, he's, he's got a PhD and yet he works as a tent maker, whereas Apollos has a respectable, respectable job, Apollos seems more secure in himself, and they were fighting each other, saying, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul, I follow Peter. And I'm better than you because of who I'm following. And Paul is going, okay, number one, okay, here's what you're doing. You're ranking. You're ranking people in, in terms of who's better than who. Stop that right now. Stop it. Everybody is extremely original. Even I've been treating people for 25 years. And I've had a number of identical twins in my practice where I've treated both twins. And once you get to know people, even identical twins, have very distinct personalities. Once you know them, you don't get them mixed up once you know them because everybody is different. We have different environments, different temptations, different biological constitutions, different upbringings. Therefore, making a head-to-head -head comparison is impossible, okay? Now, one of my jobs, I work in the pharmaceutical industry, and so when they come up with new drugs, they hired me to travel to doctors to explain how they work and stuff like that. And um, sometimes we do head-to-head -head comparisons between two products. When that happens, the number of people in the study has to be astronomical if you have two similar products. Because to find differences, you have to sift through hundreds, if not thousands of people to find significant differences between two similar products. Well, we are all very similar products with incredible amounts of variables. So to make a scientific comparison between two people is impossible. There are too many things. You can't, no two people are raised in the same way. No two people get the exact same treatment from their parents. Very often when somebody comes to my office and I read a, a little biography out before I see them for the first time, I got the therapist will give me a little rundown on what's going on. And I read that and I get an impression and then I look at the patient and I get an impression. And sometimes that impression's negative. Oh, this person's just a big drug addict and all they wanna do is smoke weed all day and they're lazy and so forth. And those are initial reactions very often. And then I get the story. And in almost every single case, my opinion of that person switches like 108. Once I get more information, my opinion changes a great deal. Okay? More information is what we need. And so the idea is, and Paul's going to focus on this, he said, look, your judgments based on superficial things, based on what I wear and my appearance and where I'm from and what I do for a living, you're, you're judging me and you're ranking me as inferior to Apollos and those guys. Number one, I don't care. 
I don't care what you think. He says it right here. I don't care what you think. I don't even rank myself. I don't care how I compare. All that matters is what Christ thinks of me. Your opinion of me is nothing. Okay? I don't care what you think. All right? And so for one thing, what you're doing is pointless. It's pointless. It's wrong. Okay? Because only Christ's opinion matters. So it's wrong what you're doing. But it's also stupid. It's stupid. So don't get ahead of the master and jump to conclusions with your judgments before all the evidence is in. Okay. Now, when is all the evidence going to be in? When is that? Yeah, not on this side. Not on this side. I don't have the mental capacity to absorb all the evidence from, from one person. I need to know your genetic code and what all of those genes mean. I don't have the cerebral capacity to do that kind of summation. I don't. In fact, nobody does. Nobody does. Yeah. When he comes, he will, bring all, uh, he will bring out in the open and place in evidence all kinds of things we never even dreamed of. Inner motives and purposes and prayers. Only then will any one of us get to hear the well done of God. So Paul is just saying what I just alluded to. Everything. You know, when people have near-death experiences, their cognitive capacity goes up a thousand billion percent. Everybody tells me that. I've, I've interviewed over a hundred of these people, and one of the things they tell you is that your what you know there is so much, and you can just comprehend stuff that there's no way you can hold. You come back in your body, and you're like, "Oh my gosh, I knew everything, and now I don't know squat." You know, now that I'm back in my body, I can't I can't hold all that. It's like, wow, for a minute, my mind was so expanded. On that side. You, you, you can comprehend all that stuff. And then you go, oh, I see how it all makes sense. But on this side, we don't have the ability to do all that. And that is what our assessment, um, of God's assessment of us, that's what matters. And we're all going to understand, yeah, he's right. Because we'll see the whole picture then. I'm doing, okay, all I'm doing right now, friends, is showing how these things pertain to Apollos and me. So that you'll learn restraint and not rush into making judgments without knowing all the facts. It's important to look at things from God's point of view. All right. And right now, we can try to look at things from God's point of view. When we're having difficulty with somebody and you don't have any natural compassion for them because they're behaving in a way that's not positive towards you, um, emotionally, we want to ruminate on the bad in them. That's very natural. And this is where one of the prayers that we have to say is, God, help me to see this person the way you do. I need some compassion for this person because, naturally speaking, I don't have it. You tell me to love my enemies. Guess what? I don't have it in me to love somebody who's threatening my job or my reputation or my finances or my marriage or whatever. Okay? So I can't, I can't feel good about that. But if I see them through your eyes, you can do that. And I, I promise you, if you do that, you will suddenly discover that, you know, as you pray for your enemies, that's an act of love. That's an act of love. That's how you love your enemies. That's the number one way that you love your enemies is to pray for them. And when you do that, you'll be shocked to discover that compassion will come. I've, had, I've experienced this personally. If somebody that has hurt me in the worst way imaginable, and I didn't think it would be possible to feel anything positive for that individual. And... I, I prayed and did that, and I was blown away when I realized, oh my gosh, I'm feeling compassion for this person who's literally ground me into the dirt, okay? And th that's how that works. I'm like, that is one of the most supernatural things I've ever seen in my life, okay? But it really works. But, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, it's like when you do that, he, he doesn't give you the full picture of them, but he gives you enough so that at least you can make the hate go away, Okay. I would rather not see you inflating or deflating reputations based on mere hearsay. For who do you know that really knows you, knows your heart? And even if they did, is there anything they would discover in you that you could take credit for? So say, look, you're lifting Apollos on, 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 a, on a pedestal, or me on a pedestal, or Peter on a pedestal. Okay? Now, think about it. Ask yourself, if somebody were to assess you and they knew you really, really, really good, and they said, oh, you are just 
oh my gosh, Gary, you're the best Gary ever. You know, I mean, you're just most wonderful. He brought me great coffee and everything, and I just love you so much, and you're better than all these other people who didn't bring me anything. <laughs> all right? <laughs> all right, and he's saying, he said, look, even if that, it's okay. It's like, look, um, bottom line is that anything good in you came from Christ. So can you really get full credit for that? Just like for me, is there anything you think, oh, that's great, but what did I, everything that I have is a gift. So can I take credit? Can I really take credit for the good? The answer is it all goes back to Christ. And so when you lift somebody on a pedestal, it's like, okay, Jesus made it very clear. You will be judged according to the light you have. The more you have, the more you will be judged for. In other words, we're responsible for that. Okay, and so just because somebody might have some positive attributes, have some gifts, that doesn't mean that they are better than somebody without those because God grades on a scale. He grades on a scale. The more you have, the harder you're judged. The less you have, the easier you're judged. So it is quite possible for somebody who looks really fantastic in the world's eyes, who seems to have everything going for him, and when God is through assessing them, they come down to, instead of on a scale of 1 to 10, they come out to a 6. And then somebody else who didn't have hardly anything, okay, but they're also a 6 because he does, he, he, he does great on a scale in terms of your, his overall assessment. He takes it all into consideration. You already have more access to God than you can handle. Without bringing either Apollos or me into it, you're sitting on top of the world, at least God's world, and we're right there sitting alongside you, okay? So you're already, you know, it's like, look, I'm not trying to put you down. You're doing great, but don't put us down either, okay? I mean, it's not good for you to be judging people for one thing, okay? And if we're helping you, awesome. But that's God helping you. Give God credit for that. Don't sit there and just judge us on who's better, as this is, this is childish. Now he gets into the part where he's saying, okay, for you that are thinking like, because the, the, the Corinthians would be like, oh, Paul thinks he's all that. Oh my gosh, Paul thinks he is like the best thing ever. And he's like God's representative. And he just thinks he's so hot, you know? And it's like, and they were kind of mocking him like that. And so he's like, oh my goodness gracious. Do you think like being a, like, oh, he's, he's way up here lording his authority over all of us. And so he thinks, you know, he's got this great light being in charge of all of Christianity, right? It's like, man, I mean, talk about an ego. What kind of guy is this? They're talking about narcissistic, you know? Yeah. Uh, I forget exactly where it says it somewhere in, I think, one of Paul's letters, but I, it sounds like he wasn't exactly a fiery or maybe the best speaker. Yes, yeah, yeah. There is some evidence to, to suggest that. He said that in, in the book of Corinthians, he said that. You know, he's actually said that a couple chapters back. Okay. He came out and said that, you know, when I came, I was scared to death, you know, it's like I, I didn't come off as, I, this is, there was nothing eloquent about what I said. It's amazing you guys came to Christ because that wasn't, you know, I was very, you know, I'm, I've got a PhD in Judaism, okay, my degree is in the Old Testament. My degree is in, you know, all the, 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 the writings of the rabbis, and here I am talking to Gentiles. I don't even have a I didn't even have a high school diploma in this stuff, okay? And so this is way outside my wheelhouse. So no, I'm not confident. I'm going into something that I am not educated to do. And so I am completely dependent on God because my abilities don't apply in this situation. I mean, if you want me to wax eloquently about the book of Isaiah, I've got you, but these people don't know anything about the book of Isaiah. And so these skills are meaningless to this audience. And so yes, he was insecure. And some of the Corinthians picked up on that, okay? And it's like, yeah, Paul, you know, it's like you elevate him to, you know, God's representative. Who does he think he is? And so now he goes into this, this part where he says, if you think that being an apostle is this great, glorious thing, and we think we're all that, let me tell you what life as an apostle is like. So he goes on and says, it seems to me that God has put us who bear his message on stage in a theater in which no one wants to buy a ticket. In other words... Do you have any idea how much rejection I face? Okay, I'm out there going from town to town, and you think everybody comes up and, and, and applauds? You think we're the what? The, we're the Beatles? Is that what you think this is like? This is not any. This is the anti-Beatles. Okay, most people dismiss us, or curse us, or look at us like we're crazy. So no, people aren't lining up. You, th this job that God has given me means facing a whole lot of rejection. You like rejection? 
That's what we get. Hello. We're something everyone stands around and stares at like an accident in the street. We're the Messiah's misfits. You might be sure of yourselves, but we live in the midst of frailties and uncertainties. You might be well thought of by others, but we're mostly kicked around. Much of the time, we don't have enough to eat. We wear patched and threadbare clothes. We get doors slammed in our faces. We pick up odd jobs anywhere we can to eke out a living. Okay? So Paul's not living off these people. He's not taking up a collection for himself. He goes from town to town and works to support himself so he doesn't have to ask anybody for money. Okay? Helps his credibility. And that's what he does. And so he's taking these odd jobs that are beneath him educationally, but he does it for the sake of the people he's serving. And he's not well received by the majority of the people. This is not one of those jobs where people are stroking your ego, telling you you're all that. So he's putting that straight. If you think that I'm prideful about being an apostle, it's like, seriously, I'm going without meals, dude. <laughs> you know, you know, I haven't had a new, cl new set of clothes in, in years, for crying out loud. No, no, it's not. It's not what you think at all. When they call us names, we say, God bless you. When they spread rumors about us, we put in a good word for them. We're treated like garbage, potato peelings from the culture's kitchen, and it's not getting any better. I'm not writing all this as a neighborhood school just to make you feel rotten. I'm writing as a father to you, my children. I love you and want you to grow up well, not spoiled. There's a lot of people around who can't tell you what you can, what you, oh, I'm sorry. Says, There's a lot of people around who can't wait to tell you what you're doing wrong, but there aren't many people willing to help you grow up. It is as Jesus helped me proclaim God's message to you that I became your father. I'm not, you know, asking you to do anything I'm not already doing myself. This is why I sent Timothy to you earlier. He is also my dear son and true to the master. He will refresh your memory on the instructions I regularly give all the churches on the way of Christ. So he's trying to stress and it's like, okay, yes, I'm, I'm, I might seem harsh and he's gonna get harsher as the letter goes on. But he says, look, my, my goal is I want you to grow up right. I want you to be mature. Um, I know he goes, being stuck in immaturity is not good for you. It's not good for you eternally. It's not good for you spiritually. So I'm everything I say is to try to help you. Okay, and I'm you know, and if if you're judging me negatively, I don't care. But it, what matters is that you get fed from God. Okay, and I I haven't done anything to disqualify myself. So whatever your criticisms are. Ask yourself, are those criticisms severe enough to disqualify him? Because there are some legitimate criticisms you could have. If he came there and he was hitting on all the women, okay, or fleecing them for money, all right, or to get caught lying, being manipulative, okay, uh, being quick to anger because his ego was bruised, well, yeah, well, then they would have a case. And that's his point. He says, is there anything? Yes, so I'm not the greatest speaker. I don't dress the best. I'm a foreigner. Okay, God, yeah, 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 right. Any, does any of that disqualify me? Have you seen anything inconsistent with being a follower of Christ in my presentation? No? Okay. So does that stuff really matter? What matters is that you get that. Now he's going to address the instigators of the anti-Paul movement. Okay. So there are some, there are a small number of people who are really, I mean, because there are factions where people are fighting each other. And at the head of these factions are people who are like, staunch anti-Paul people or anti-Apollos or whatever. And so, because we got, we got real fights going on in this church. So now he's going to address some of these here ringleaders that are causing problems. I know there are some among you who are so full of themselves, they never listen to anyone, let alone me. They don't think I'll ever show up in person, but I'll be there sooner than you think, God willing. And then we'll see if they're full of anything but hot air. God's way is not a matter of mere talk. It's an empowered life. So how should, I, how should I prepare to come to you? As a severe disciplinarian who makes you toe the mark or as a good friend and counselor who wants to share heart to heart with you, you decide. Okay? So that's the chapter, you know? Um, he, he very much stays on point. He's incredibly logical. He makes brilliant logical points. And so he kind of appeals to them spiritually 
and and cognitively this, to let him say that you know what you're doing this is incredibly immature and he makes a brilliant case I mean it's 2,000 years ago and it's uh, it holds water today in a big way and it's very you know I mean as I think I mentioned this last time but when it comes to as when we're baby Christians this is very natural to compare teachers um, my first joint campus crusade for Christ, I was a relatively new Christian, and my first Bible study teacher, Mike Colson, was really dynamic, a great worship leader, fantastic speaker. Um, he just really brought the Bible out, and I just loved the guy. He was so fantastic. It was my first Bible study ever, and it was awesome. Well, unfortunately, he only had one semester left, and after that semester, he left, and we ended up getting a different Bible study leader who was about as opposite as you could get. Guy was quiet, reserved, boring, <laughs> you know. And I was like, I, I was crushed. I was like, man, this is like withdrawal. And I'm so used to this dynamic, exciting, you know, Bible study presentation. And now this is like slow in everything. And it really caused, it was almost a depression, you know, because it's like, what happened? You know, I like that other guy. And uh, one of the lessons that I had to learn over the next semesters and years is that what mattered was not how dynamic and wonderful the Bible study leader was, but before I went into that class, where was my heart? And if I prayed to God for, to, to teach me through whatever in this Bible study, I always got something out of it, no matter how bad the teacher was. And that carried me through college. I mean, that because I had some real losers, you know, and everything. But, you know, I got something out of it. And I learned, you know, that's what matters is going into it. Think, okay, God, you teach me something. And boom, it would happen. Even with people who just, you know, just read, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just got there and just read the Bible and said, okay, any questions next? <laughs> okay. Yeah. But it's amazing. God will teach you no matter what. And comparing people, everybody. You know, you can learn something from everybody, even bad folks. You learn what not to do, okay? Everybody is an education. And some people, unfortunately, are an example of how not to live the Christian life. And they're very good at their job, some of them, okay? And then others, you learn other things. You know, they have positive attributes that you can emulate. There's something to learn from everybody, okay?